Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Mario Nawfall X Spaces. Hello and good. You are here having followed the reminder link very early or potentially listening to the recording, and we are excited to have you. Looking at the title today, it says An Investor's Guide to Token Presales with at Join Commonwealth. Join Commonwealth. Commonwealth is going to be our sponsor for today's sp uh, spaces. And we appreciate you guys pulling up. Now, who am I? I'm Pulse Digital. I'm your co host for today. So I'm up here uh, in the side seat uh, while Mario drives the motorcycle, as it were. And I've got a great team of people that are going to be helping me out over on his side to get all these speakers approved. So, notice obviously join commonwealth is going to be here and we've got a list of other people that are going to join us for this subject guests and speakers from throughout the industry they're going to be filling in as we go through the first minutes here now as a listener what can you do during these first minutes a few things one you could raise your hand Eric, good luck. see if you can get a speaker spot for yourself uh, we go through speakers we kind of rotate uh, as the spaces go so you can try if you've got something to say something to interject uh, if not we can't get to you the comment section check out the bottom right at least on mobile and throw your comments down there questions for our guests questions for the sponsor anything that we bring up that you have uh, concerns about you can tag us down in the comments that's a great way to be a part of the conversation it's also a great way to get a couple of views on your posts so it might be worthwhile while you're listening to just go down there and type something up throw a picture whatever you want to do down there we'd appreciate that if you do that the share button is also very helpful either to let people know that you're here by sharing this space on your timeline or sending a dm directly to somebody to say hey this is what we're doing check out the conversation maybe they'd like to join us they'd appreciate a dm uh, and then the last one is emojis emojis is how you're going to let me know today that you can hear what we're talking about what you think about it thumbs up thumbs down hearts all those things uh because space is still lets us do those for free and i'd appreciate that if you play along so in the meantime, you notice we've had our guests fill in. We've got speakers that are taking up our spots. So uh, what I want to do first is I want to say hi to at Join Commonwealth. We've got a couple of people uh, that I believe are going to be joining us. I think I've got Kyle and Tim, probably at least. Kyle, is that you over there? Yep. Yeah, right. yeah. Loud and clear, man. Mike sounds good. And then is Tim here somewhere? Let me scroll. I'm here. I'm the, I'm, I'm the Commonwealth uh, smiley face. <laughs> That's what I thought. Excellent, man. Thank you for joining. I you guys coming in. Your mic sounds loud and clear, too. Sound good on my end? It's good. Five on no. five. Sound good. Good. And then uh, is Jonathan going to be, as I look around, Jonathan might be the last one here. Are we waiting on John at all? I don't think John's joining. Tony's going to be here uh, as the third part of the Commonwealth team. Oh, I see Tony down there. What's up, Tony? Thanks for joining. That's cool. And tell, uh, tell John we missed him. <laughs> so we've got a, a whole bunch of things that we're going to talk about today. If you guys have been to the spaces with Mario before, you know there's kind of a, a format here. What we're going to do, I'm going to give you a little teaser up front, let these guys tell you just a touch about uh, Commonwealth, because we are going to do a full AMA later where I'm going to hand the mic around to these guys. We're going to learn all about the project. They're going to give us the deep stuff. But I want to teaser up front, and then there's been a whole bunch of news that we're going to get into, and we're going to use this panel of esteemed guests uh, to kind of give you guys a taste of the news and what, uh, from an editorial perspective, some of these people think about that. So uh, whichever one of you gentlemen would best uh, be the one to do this, can you give me like an elevator-style pitch about what we're going to hear a lot more about later from Common? Carl, do you want to? Sure. Yeah, so um, we'd like to, I think the, the easiest way kind of to describe this would be it's a it's a Robin Hood style it's a Robin Hood moment for the crypto space where and I mean that by in a way that um, but it's but it gets a lot better than that but but you know in the way that retail could always invest in the stock market but they didn't have the like it was difficult for them to do that right then Robin Hood came along gave them a really simple platform to make that easy and uh, but you know that was still them investing investing in a secondary market uh, you know, still till, till today, there hasn't been a way for the 99%. We call that all street. Um, you know, it's very similar to the, the, uh, the, the wall street bets movement. Uh, all street hasn't had a chance to get into the same kind of opportunities, uh, private and early round seed round deals that, uh, the 1% have had the opportunity to do, you know, because of things like accreditation laws and, um, you know, that's been largely walled off. And then even in the crypto space, you have to be either a, a big VC, uh, an influencer, or extremely well connected to, you know, to get into these opportunities. So uh, as the narrative has been, you know, all over the place the past 72 hours or so, there's a lot of scrutiny around the way that, uh, you know, ever since the, the Sam Bankman uh, SBF, Alameda style of investing in projects and marking up, uh, you know, these projects 
round after round. By the time it gets to the retail, everyone on this call pretty much that gets to, that's listening, by the time they get an opportunity to buy into a project, it's already up, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200 X from where they invested. And uh, at that point, um, and then he, they, they kind of invented this whole, uh, you know, low float, meaning low circulating supply and uh, very high, extremely high valuation. And, uh, and what people don't realize is how that affects the, the inflation over time. It, you get like, Argentina, Venezuela, um, kinds of inflation levels in the crypto space. And so it's just been largely unfavorable, um, especially this, this run and last run uh, in the way that 2017 wasn't so bad. And so we, we kind of want to look back and we don't want to say that, you know, all VCs are bad. Uh, we just think there's, there's a time for a major shift. And so back to the, sorry, the elevator pitch, which is longer than it should be an elevator pitch, but it's it's uh, Robinhood um, meets Wall Street bets and A16Z, and so we are recreating in a decentralized, fully autonomous way the traditional fund model. It's you know I, I like I like the idea of innovating systems that are old and legacy and not completely trying to reinvent a wheel. And so it's a very familiar type of model, a VC fund model, and uh, and it's a, we like to think of it as it's a risk minimized way for the crypto curious and the crypto and the crypto native to be able to invest in early stage deals and uh and be essentially fully managed on their behalf if they want to and um and there's a lot of ways we can get into during this discussion about how it's risk minimized and the upside for that kind of stuff the, the good news about spaces with me and mario is because since we occupy the top office on x spaces it's a very long elevator ride kyle so i don't mind that you went a little deeper into it some of the elevators might be a little shorter but this one i assure you is is a very very nice ride um i made two notes if i can i want to reply to two things you said um this week I, I had probably no joke in the last two weeks 10 spaces where i talked about uh roaring kitty coming back was making me get um occupy wall street vibes so the idea that you're using the 99 percent and i'm resisting uh going into my bernie sanders impression i promise i won't do it until at least halfway through the spaces uh and the the all street versus wall street those harken again back to the uh uh, Occupy Wall Street, just that whole ethos that really, for me personally, when I got into crypto, part of the anti-bank sentiment was part of what got me into crypto. And I love that you guys are using the 99% because it makes me think of uh, the 1% and all that. And then the other thing I wrote down, I had a great conversation just here on Spaces yesterday with Nick from Bubble Maps, who was co-hosting with me. And we literally just talked about something that you mentioned. And I'm so glad I had the Spaces with Nick because you mentioned low float uh, leading to high market cap and in um, the inflation that that comes from. I'm like so much smarter on that now because I had the spaces with Nick to go over this. What do you, when we go into that, because I want to ask you one question about that. What you're saying is it just leads to this like small amount of tokens or small amount of whatever's being released. And then there's just so much held by uh, VCs, second VCs, cliffs, vested KOLs and stuff. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so I think a good analogy, I, I made a, if anyone who's curious, yesterday I made a pretty much an entire, I have a YouTube channel as well, and my whole video yesterday was about this topic, but it's not just yesterday, I, I've been talking about this for, like, like out, out, outspoken about this for at least a year now, um, and that's, and but really longer, because the way Commonwealth's DNA started with solving this whole problem, the, you know, the way, and to answer your question quickly, Yes, that's what it is. It's like the to use the tip of the iceberg analogy, right? And so it, this was what Kobe used in his Substack recently. It's like what you see on launch day is a tip of the iceberg, but what you don't realize is that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes down to how many tokens are should be are, are coming into supply over the period of you know between two to four to five years. Which when you have projects that launch with you know between one like Worldcoin to you know, six, seven, eight percent supply, like Celestia, or whatever. Um, you've got you know hundreds of percent a year of inflation uh, ahead of you. So um, it's it's impossible unless you have crazy demand, crazy revenue. And the fact is, is that most protocols and projects in this space aren't producing revenue at all. Like Cardano does. Like uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, in, anyway. Uh, like yeah, they make. The, almost nothing, but uh, in order for you to be able to offset that kind of inflation, you would have to have huge revenue. 
um, you know, and, and that would have to play into a sustainable token economy. So back to the, the point of our DNA from Commonwealth, as we've demonstrated by virtue of creating a product that was community first and distributed, uh, it says a lot about how long we've been thinking about this because we started about over two and a half years ago and it started with really how do we build the sustainable economy and uh, and so the first round of fundraising wasn't from VCs. In fact, we didn't even want VCs to be involved. Uh, the first round of fundraising was from was essentially us selling an NFT and we wanted to keep this very, very uh, tight lipped. And so it was it was in stealth mode for a long time. Even when we, we did the first raise of a million dollars, it was to our community, to most of my community. Like, and they, in blind faith, they I'm, invested into. Yeah, I, I don't want to I don't want to cut you off, man. But yeah, you're kind of off on your own <laughs> uh, with all that. Are, are you going to wrap that back to the, the flow thing or uh, go to Mikey? Because Mikey well, had his hand up so long. I think it's turning blue. I, th I think the, the point of what you're making is, is that the, so the so the high the low flow IFTV is dominated by a very few token holders holding an enormous percentage of supply, which lead uh, which leads at uh, which they don't genuinely care about. They're not community members. They don't add a lot of value. Some, some will, but the but it's it's a high concentration of tokens in a in a few very few such people. There's no distribution, and that is the problem. That is the biggest problem in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll let people, uh, that same sub stack is what Nick brought up. You mentioned Kobe's name, right? I think that was the same thing that Nick was talking about yesterday. So that's for anybody that didn't hear any of that. Uh, that sub stack is obviously very hot right now. Mikey, what's up with the hand? How are you, man? What's up, Pulse? Hey man, first time, long time. Love the show. And yeah, the, uh, the carpal tunnel was starting to kick in with my hand <laughs> up so high. Um, in, in regards to that, I think that, you know, a lot of altcoins are, are kind of turning off, you know, the retail investors because they're coming in with these high starting market caps. And in order to do a 2X or a 3X or whatnot, it's very hard for retail. So that's why you're seeing kind of the push in meme coins. That's why meme coins are thriving. You know, obviously everybody's getting rugged on Solana and whatnot. But with the altcoins, they're just coming in at such a high starting market cap that it doesn't make sense. And it is kind of, especially with something on a launch pad or private sale, you're kind of going against anything you can to kind of get in there and try to do any kind of, you know, uh, gains in that sense. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, we, we've seen a shift from the last bull run to now where just these, these all coins are coming in so much higher starting market cap and it just makes it unattainable for a retail investor to kind of make any type of gains. And like I said, that's why I think the mean coins are kind of doing so well. I think that's probably why pump.fum became so popular because you get the sense that you're buying like the, the smallest, stinkiest market cap you can get. Uh, it, there, I, there is a part of the market that would prefer to get something at a much smaller market cap. There's also a lot of the market that doesn't understand uh, fully diluted uh, versus uh, what you see on a on a buy bot or whatever, right? Because what Kyle's talking about with all this tip of the iceberg token situation is they they might not be aware of the fully diluted value. Somebody in the other space mentioned how important it was to just go buy the fully. They said they never never look at anything but the fully diluted market cap value for projects because it's the only way to get a true look at what it might be like. So I. I think you're right, Mikey, and I think the true DGENs really do, at least I know people that will look at something that's, man, 250,000 market cap, and they're going to be like, that's already gone, like that's already sent or whatever, and then you got other people that their projects are starting now at 50, 75 million, uh, so yeah. It's different flavors of ice cream. I suppose it's Neapolitan and chocolate for everybody. Uh, before I get into that question, I haven't seen many other people throw their hands up and stuff. I have a rack of news pulled up that I, I absolutely want to get to like two or three things from this list today. And I know that we've got some guests that are going to be able to weigh in on this. The first thing that has been on the news for me today is what is up with Ethereum because this is all ETF hype and I can't do a spaces on Mario's account and not get into the, the change in the price of Ethereum and stuff like this. It's massive. So uh, in the order that I haven't heard from anybody, yet because Mikey and Kyle uh, have already said a few words. Uh, so uh, let's see. AMC, I haven't seen you in a minute. Uh, what do you think with the price change in Ethereum? Is this by the rumor stuff or are we really in it? I think we, uh, so hi, first of all, everybody. <laughs> nice to, to see some of you guys here again. Also, Kyle. Um, yeah, so I think we, we just need to wait a couple hours to watch the news, what's what's happening now with that uh, 19B4 filing, um, if all of them are in order, if they're approved, and we move on to the S1. And as soon as the S1 uh, has the green light, I think it's basically then a sealed deal that, that we are actually getting the spot in ETH, Ethereum ETF then in the next couple of days. 
So it is. It for me, it just comes down what's happening with the S one filing. If the nineteen four B goes goes through, and um, that's that's the end of the story. Then you know. So then 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 we basically have it. So and I was actually surprised this morning when when I woke up. Kai knows where 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 I'm living in which country. So I I woke up. And, and, I, and I saw everything pumping and I was like, what happened in the last six hours while I was sleeping? And uh, then I had, had, to, had to catch up to, to, to everything. That's not the worst way to wake up, though. I mean, that's sometimes yeah. that's better than a shot of coffee right in the arm. You wake up to a green candle. I almost forget what that feels like, man. Yeah, I, I'm a little candle. jealous, honestly. I'm a little jealous of your version of the story because I was scrambling in the middle of the day. Uh, Zillion <laughs> knows my fondness for throwing a hand up, so he's going to get it from me this time. Zillion, good morning, sir. What's up? Hey, good morning. Yeah, um, on the Ethereum uh, developments, um, I think I spoke about it uh, last time, but I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to add a few things. The first one is that we see this first batch of, uh, of, of buy-in uh, right now kind of uh, sets a new, uh, a new, not resistant, but even a new support uh, at 3,800. Uh, I think that the, the other batch that is going to come after this, so this should be the fair value of the ETF uh, pre-flows uh, estimation. Um, and from now on, any price uh, increase that we have from 3,800 all the way to uh, sell the news uh, type of uh, price action is going to be basically people uh, people speculating. But uh, I think the, this first base that we have built from yesterday until today is basically the base of people that were supposed to be holders uh, uh, of Ethereum, but uh, due to underperformance, they had to balance their uh, portfolios and the other way. So, um, yeah, things that, yeah. look... What was that, sorry? I said I hadn't heard that take yet. That's actually a good one. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, things look good for Ethereum. I think that, as you know, this um, you know when you do <clears throat> when you go uh, into this market with significant amounts of money, you kind of try to uh, your metrics are a little bit different than a DGEN. Uh, so for us, uh, Ethereum is basically going to do uh, a public offering, right? Uh, first IPO, basically. Uh, you should expect Ethereum to to have the the market cap uh, of uh, two times Coinbase, uh, two to three times Coinbase. So this is the expected amount of money that uh, that is expected to go into this Ethereum. That's right. Uh, uh, ETF. Yeah. Um, so this for that. I'm I'm writing a note down just because I know I'm going to see you in spaces. I'm going to hold you to that, bro. Quick one. Uh, there is right. There is uh, in total uh, in Ethereum. Um, um, historically, Ethereum suffered from a lack of liquidity. Uh, uh, pre pre Binance, Ethereum was very liquid. Uh, Binance kind of fixed that situation, but that's another story, right? We can talk about that later. Uh, for the good or the better, but right now, I think from a liquidity perspective, there is basically. A uh, total of 14 million Ethereum in all exchanges. I think uh, of that uh, 14 million, there is a lot of uh, custody only. So there is a lot of very low, so very, uh, very, in, um, very inactive, very inactive uh, supply. So I think that uh, overall, the ETF has um, you can value the the value, the max value to be added at uh, three times the market cap of uh, Coinbase. Well, I'm going to keep an eye on that. By around 7, 7 million Ethereum. I'm going to keep an eye on that. Somebody write that down for me. I see somebody down in the spaces that I haven't had in a week or two. Irina, are you near your microphone? I'd love to hear what you think about the filing and the potential that this goes through and stuff. I don't know if she's around the mic. Sometimes you call on people. Maybe not. What about uh, Jonathan? Are you near your microphone? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm here. How's it going, guys? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thanks for joining. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Just, just a comment, a little bit off topic with the Ethereum. Um, you know, I keep hearing that there was a speaker just now that was talking about like why everyone's going towards meme coins. Um, besides a handful of people, like I don't know any of the retail guys that are up in meme coins. Like they're launching twenty five thousand of these things a day. Ninety nine point nine nine percent of them are all rags. Um, 
you know, so fine, retail may only be getting like two or three X at the moment from like these, you know, public sales or um, projects they're buying off launch pads. But those are projects that have been building for like two or three years and they've spent five, six million dollars building these projects. So I don't agree with the argument at all. I've heard it for the last like two or three days and I've, I've been having debates with people and people are making no sense. Like meme coins are not a way out of it. It's a dream for retail to get rich. Like I want to know a hundred people that have made money off meme coins. <laughs> There's not a hundred people out there. But I know loads of people that have bought um, IDOs of launch pads and they may only be doing two or three X at the moment. But if they hold those tokens and they're doing their correct research and these guys actually have something, those two, three Xs, you know, over the next two years can turn into five, six, seven, eight, ten Xs. So I don't agree with the argument at all. Fair enough. I think I've heard a discussion before that meme coins appeal to the same segment that would prefer scratchers tickets or lottery entries to. It's the, the like you described it, the retail dream to riches. That once that it's like, I'm going to spend that dollar and turn it into a million, where it's like somebody else is like, I'm going to spend 25000 and turn it into fifty and do that 25 times. Like, that's, it's harder. I get what you mean, though. That's, that's a good take on that. And I'm going to, uh, Mikey got booted down. I didn't get a chance to answer that. I'm specifically uh, I was going to let him answer, but I see he's not here. Hydrated, I haven't heard from you in a minute. What are your thoughts on, on Ethereum right now? Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, just quick intro. I'm Jacob, co-founder of Zebran Capital and HydraDX. Building in space in a couple of years, uh, trying to create it as well. So for the Ethereum, yeah, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm not into actually like security laws and stuff. But what I really like from yesterday's spaces and, and today as well is uh, Zillion's point about the lack of supply of uh, Ethereum or <laughs> physical Ethereum on exchanges as also Ethereum is like heavily used in DeFi and all these like restaking games and other stuff and also it's like extremely fragmented across all the L2s so any any notion of any notion of the marginal buyer or even like front running of the marginal buyer as we saw with the uh, bitcoin etf or like bitcoin pre-pump for the etf and then later uh can be just like more amplified more more stronger on it than on bitcoin itself just because of there's like much less liquid it's a smaller market cap it's also very well distributed not as these uh, low floats uh, and this can create uh, this can create some like excitement. So I think it's like very positive uh, for the whole space. Also, I think Ethereum will appeal to like very different type of investors, as uh, as Ethereum resembles much more of like technological platform, something like Fang, uh, much rather than digital gold. So it has like different story, different promise, uh, different appeal for different investors. So overall, I think it's great. And also like. It's a big reveal, big relief uh, for Ethereum community and Maxis who were down bad and they were like beaten. You, you could see uh, how it BTC is just like never ending going down. So it's yeah. like a breath of fresh air for a lot of them. I think is a good way to describe it, right? Or like getting to come up for air after being underwater. Uh, and points to Zillion for having this guy back up your points, man. Uh, you get two two spaces points, free credit to your account on that. Uh, before we switch subjects on stuff, I want to give the guys from uh, Commonwealth, if you guys hadn't uh, had a chance yet, Tim or uh, Tony, if you guys want to say anything about Ethereum, you guys got any thoughts on, on how close this is, how real this is, or are we just getting suckered in again? I'm not here for my views on Ethereum, guys. Um, maybe 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 Tony, who's a dev, might have some thoughts. We actually were on Ethereum uh, Basenet, and then we went over to um, zk Sync a roll up. We thought that was the most scalable one, and then we decided, no, listen, uh, zk Sync um, isn't quite ready for us, even though we still believe it's going to be a massive game changer on the L2s. And then we went to Base. Um, so you know, we, we were we're still in the Ethereum ecosystem, very bullish. Uh, I'm curious about how things play out long term on the Ethereum ecosystem with all the the DeFi and you know if the ARB is getting smaller and smaller with with less TVL inside Ethereum and more being going to the side chains. But you know I'm not I'm not your expert, but um you know I'm enjoying the pump. Hey, that's good enough for me. You don't need to be an expert to ride that green candle. <laughs> Absolutely, hey. uh, I see that hand up. Go ahead down there. 
Hey guys, uh, so regarding this Ethereum price bump, uh, I've got a few points like I don't think it's totally an ETF and it's a uh, mixed with the with this investor sentiment as well because we have seen like from March of the 11th the prices in like a um, larger term downtrend you can say and for the last one month the market is uh, you can say are really boring so that thing compiles up to the price action and this ETF thing is just I think a catalyst to push uh, to the push pushing the price to a new highs and as soon as it gets to 4k i guess we'll see some liquidation because uh, that local top plays a major role in that and i'd like to know like what do you guys think technically uh, if anyone can add to it like in terms of investor sentiment and where the market has been throughout these uh, two or three months I definitely can't speak to anything legally, but I do agree with your assessment that 4K might be a problem just because people love big round numbers. That's just, people just set, you know, when they set uh, stops and when they set sell points and stuff, they just love round numbers. So I don't disagree with that. Um, Irene, it, Irina is actually the lawyer in the spaces that I did recognize. I don't know if she's still around or near her microphone. So when it comes to asking someone, you know, for a legal opinion, I know she wouldn't even be willing to give one on this, but that it gets so muddy so quick. And that's why it's, it's hard to have a really nuanced conversation about legal stuff on spaces but without assembling a panel of like great legal minds it would be super difficult to get into um the one thing i want to throw on the end of the conversation because i gave everybody a chance to speak about it no one brought up uh that it could have been on the back of not just the ETF, but this shift is after the uh, SAB 121 vote, uh, the bill in Congress that passed uh, in the Senate, I'm sorry, uh, no one really mentioned that that also might be part of the combining effect. So ETH, ETH ETF rumors are good, and that's one thing, and that might affect, but the overall shift in the Senate, also there was a, a member of the FDIC who announced his resignation, and I guess he was anti-crypto too, so, uh, you know, little little things that all add up would be what I come to at the end of that. But I appreciate everybody's takes on that. It's certainly uh, worthy of an entire spaces. We could get into that a lot more, but thanks for everybody's opinion. Believe it or not, as I get a sip of water, the uh, whole conversation took almost half the spaces. So you guys know what time it is? It's time for a room reset. You might have not been here for the whole conversation, but if you got here at some point, hi, welcome to Mario Nawfall's X Spaces. Uh, you're hanging out with me and the boys. It's Pulse Digital up here co-hosting for Mario and a rack of guests up here today. According to the title at top, it says... An Investor's Guide to Token Presales with Join Commonwealth. Join Commonwealth is our sponsor today. They're up here. They've got guests. They've got Kyle and Tim are here as well as Tony. And we've been talking about generally just some things. Uh, we talked about token float, high float, or I'm sorry, low float, high MC stuff. Uh, and we got a taste of what they're doing over there. I've got uh, the whole team, and we're going to dive more into this. But I want to talk more broadly about token presales before we do. But before we do that. Check the comments in the bottom right. You guys got some going on down there. I appreciate that. If you have not left a comment yet, now's your chance. Because while we're still talking, there's still time. Leave a photo, leave a comment, let us know what you think about the conversation. You can also share the spaces and hit the emojis. We appreciate that. Yeah, we appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys carving out the time to be here. So what do you guys know about pre-sales? Because we're getting into this conversation shortly about this. And I know Common uh, Commonwealth is going to hit us with all of their details. But who here uh, is probably, raise, raise a hand if you think you're probably the the most most experienced pre-sale investor here. Like I've only done, uh, I'd say less than uh, 15 launch pad pre-sales. If I had to think about all the different places I've been and the, the platforms I've used in my experiences, I'm not like the expert on this. And AMC threw the hand up real quick. So I'm going to give it to him and you guys contemplate what your experience is on that. And then I'll let him go. It's yours, AMC. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, my, um, Kyle said it earlier uh, already and some other people, it's not only the, the low float um, when, when it comes to investing in, into presets for me, you know, so something that, that I learned the hard way in the last cycle is also looking at when you are talking to projects, um, who is advising the project and how are they actually vested? You know, so I'm an influencer myself. I, I know I have better access than um, most of the retail people uh, to certain things and also asking for certain things and getting that information. And there, there were certain advisors, for example, uh, with their advisory tokens completely unvested. So what do you, uh, what do you think is going to happen when a project launches and the advisor tokens are unvested? They're of course gonna dump on everybody on the listing, you know. So, and then you are wondering when you had a project where you were expecting to get, let's say, a conservative five, ten x in a roaring bull market, and then um, it turns out 
to be break even or actually running at the loss on launch date. You know, so th these are like small nuances. I think that we should also mention that it's not only the VCs, VCs that are creating a huge problem in the space, but it's also these predatory advisory deals that some influencers are actually are able to get with certain projects. What do you think generally the sentiment is on VCs? Because I've, I'm familiar most of the time when a, a project gets a VC to invest, they'll brag about it and say, hey, this is a thing. This is our VC they're investing. But you're saying that sentiment might be shifting away from the idea that advisors and VCs are always a good thing because uh, experience shows sometimes that's not the case? Yes. So I, I believe... Personally, I saw that major shift when um, the hype around retro drops came out, you know, so and and then people understood when they got the retro drop and then like three months later, there was like the first token unlock that there was a huge amount of, of token uh, supply dropped on, on the market and crushed the price. And I think after the first uh, two, three big retro drops. That was when actually most of the people woke up and said there is something wrong with uh, with that uh, with that kind of floating model. And then they they catched on to it that um, that that is actually also something that uh, VCs are heavily involved with. All right. Well, I'm going to ask an even more controversial question because I'm up here solo driving the whip today, uh, and I like the direction you're going with this. Uh, <laughs> would you say that this is? Uh, symptomatic of your average crypto investor on the bell curve of uh, the kind of people that are getting into these projects just not dying their own or they just don't know they don't know what to look for they uh, i don't want to say they're not equipped uh because the technology is now there but people just don't know to look for the bottom of the iceberg is that whose fault is that ultimately uh, am uh, so that that is actually a, um a tough question to answer whose fault that is so so Technically, it's uh, I would say it's partially the investor's fault because we always say do your own research, you know. So and and that is part of the research. So if you don't do that, so it's technically your own fault. But I think also as a key opinion leader or as an influencer, it's partially also our job to inform our community about something like that. Yeah, well, legally, there is supposed to be a form of disclosure, at least in certain circumstances, uh, at least to to. Uh dispense any legal concerns or uh, waive any indem indemnify yourself against problems and stuff like that. But I, I don't think there's any requirement to remind, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's probably like a small print in the very first edition of the light paper. And then after that, it's not like they're passing around infographics that, that constantly go over it. It's complex because I'm not, I'm not here to defend either side. I just think if I'm supposed to be the voice of moderation on this, it really does come down to like what, how available was it? Did you go look for it? Did you know this was coming into circulation? Um, it's really, really difficult to make people aware of this because you can't, you can't handhold them all the time. Uh, but you would want them to know about this in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Zillion had his hand up and then Hydrate went next. So Zillion, you got it and then we'll go to Hydrate. Yeah, um, I don't want to sound like Gary Gensler here, but, um, but there is a best practice uh, in this type of thing. So there is no obvious law, uh, but I mean... There is a best practice, um, and the best practice basically is totally uh, the, all this stuff is outside of uh, of, of of best practice uh, from a standpoint of uh, the retail exposure. Um, this um, the, the, all the, the current Ponzi nomics slash tokenomics that we have and the float models, etc. This is no innovation. This is basically just uh, a money grab. And, and, and act as if type of environment. Now, this being said, uh, you, you need to understand that this time around, I have seen, obviously, I'm involved in doing seed for litigation firms, especially for litigation firms specialized in the, in this area. And there is at least, but basically what's happening right now is that every single legal practice out there, they're spinning, uh, there is this, uh, spin off of a small division that basically does only crypto litigation and all these guys that that this this type of manipulation and benefit from it will get litigated max 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 
by 50, by mid 2015, uh, 25, sorry, that was, this is going to be the biggest stories is that group of small investors are going to get together. Now they have tools to get together. There are all these litigation firms are deploying web three type of solutions, getting them ready, et cetera. And they're all going to pay back. When you do these type of manipulations, you know, and when you do financial crimes, you get caught. Okay. This is, this is something that people need to know. Uh, so this time around, it's a different type of, of, uh, of, uh, let's say of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, wrongdoings, but uh, people are going to suffer from this. I mean, you can't float something that does nothing for a billion dollars. I, mean, I would this never, is crazy. I would never say you sound like Gary Gensler. You have a much more beautiful voice than him and okay. having a slightly negative sound, uh, uh, viewpoint on something or being critical of something is not, it's two things. It's not immediately FUD and it doesn't immediately make you the SEC. These are the type, these are the types of opinions I would expect people with nuance and gray area and, you know, deeply wrinkled brains to have. This is what it takes. It can't all be, you know, wag me vibes all the time. So I appreciate that. Don't be afraid to be negative if we're just having a conversation. Hydrate, have the hand up. You're up, bud. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I don't think it's fault of anyone. I think it's kind of like collective fault that basically, like, first of all, all these like low flow tactics, there's nothing new. Like Kobe and other people were covering this a lot in 2021 around all the FTX infamous listings. I would just say that if we as a space were not able to regulate ourselves, uh, then Thread 5 will come to regulate us, and maybe we are not very uh, far from it because of the ETAs and other regulatory capture stuff, but uh, I will guarantee you that if we will not regulate ourselves quickly uh, and we will not correct ourselves, then they will come for us, <laughs> and it will not be fun. And you probably, the one, probably the best fundament on crypto is that it's so much fun. It's, much, it's like there's no way back to go uh, to the, like, other traditional industries so you should every one of you think about it if you want to keep this funny industry and this uh, and this like craziness uh, or if you want to turn this to just finance 2.0 that's one thing and also i would also quickly uh reflect on evil vc the evil vc was as a meme kind of pushed by some like shady people initially in 2021 and then others I would just say that there is like many couple legit funds who are diamond hell that they are like diamond hands like crazy uh, good projects even buying bottoms. Uh, they are often can stake or not staking, uh, and they are really like holding assets couple of years. They are often even like round tripping their profits on on the projects, uh, and they are often like these influencers and KOLs who are actually in the race of bottom. To just uh, dump first so it's i think your only guide guiding principle would be my favorite motto from web3 summit uh less trust more truth and the quote i'm also going to take away from hydrate was they will come for us comma and it will not be fun period that's super dark too i appreciate that irena threw a hand up i think she's back at the microphone irena are you there yes i'm back Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts on this. Um, we talk always about evil VCs, but I've also seen founders who are so desperate to exit that they never enter in the first place. So crypto is a type of uh, environment where there's a lot of gambling. There is a lot of you know young founders who are also testing things out. Um, so it's, it's what Jakub said is a very fun space to watch. So on one hand, having an ICO and really having it a community-based uh, fundraising, you know, fundraising with the community, seems to be a better option because you would think that people will be holding to your project and holding to the tokens and will be more loyal to you and more supportive to the team. But at the same time, if you don't fundraise VC capital, you can't really, you know, you, if you don't bring institutional capital, you can't really count on, you know, um, substantial growth and, and growing your startup to a certain level. So it's a give and take situation and you really need to um, find your right investors, uh, whether it's a community that you need to really invest in building or whether it's a VC with whom you would want to build um, solid relations and relationships and really make sure that this fund um, gives you not just money, but also all other types of support 
like not just uh, KOLs, but you know, be there for you, be with you at the important meetings, at supporting you at the conferences, and really having regular meetings with the founding team. That that is uh, really really important. And two last very quick comments. So in terms of uh, adopting Web3 tools now in Polkadot ecosystem, Polymic protocol launched. Um, a Web3 native fundraising tool for VC. So I'm really looking forward, you know, to their onboarding and how this will play out and how they will structure this uh, in a new way for Web3 native, um, both teams and VCs uh, and make this process more transparent. And second announcement from Pokrod Ecosystem, we just partnered with the Founder Institute the largest mm. like Irina, 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 just want to jump in one second. Like, I think we're we're talking about all the value the VCs bring and how they advise the project and how they support the project. But I think, we're, and by the way, you've got a lot of background noise. I, you know, I hear little birds and stuff. I'm not sure if you can improve your mic. But I think we're pretty pretty oblivious to the flaws in the industry as well. Like, I think Binance put out two articles two days ago um, about their concerns in the VC ecosystem. Seems no one's mentioning this. Like, never happened. Um, and what they're looking for from projects. I'm going to actually bring that up and talk about it. I think this is the stuff that matters. Um, and also Bloomberg put out a piece that we cannot ignore either about what they consider as flaws in the KOL structure and the KOL rounds that projects are doing without disclosures. So I think we're all talking about, hey, the, the, the basic generic stuff VCs could bring to a project, but we're ignoring that this same model exists in the traditional world, but it's done correctly. And in the VC world, it's, it, it, you know, launching at these small market caps, high FTVs, and then the project pumps at the beginning, and then VC slowly dump on retail, which me, Scott, and Ryan are pretty critical of. And it's been the game for a while, and it doesn't, it may be changing now. Scott has been saying that, and look at Binance's uh, announcement as well, it, the tide might be turning now. Not against the whole token model, but against the way it's structured. I see paid Paid network is here. We co-invest a lot with the paid guys. Um, you know, good to have them on stage. I know Commonwealth, you guys are partnered with the show. We've got a few other VCs on stage. But anyone anyone on stage, like Zilli, you invest in a lot of these token projects. Do you think that model is going to continue as is? Or, or, or like where a project comes in, raises a small amount of money, pumps VCs exit uh, with a big unlock, and then slowly the price will diminish close to zero as VCs dump on retail. Or do you think those days are over? No, no, they're over and they're going to face litigation, very hard litigation. I mean, in 2025, I advise anyone that can invest in a litigation, crypto litigation firm to do so because they will litigate and win cases. Uh, the, the, this model, I mean, we've never seen VCs getting litigated against uh, for this type of uh, of uh, of of behavior but now we're gonna see it we're gonna see it very hard especially that most of these vcs they're pretty small plays you're able to get money out of them very quickly especially if you're a big law firm and uh, connected with with a bunch of prosecutors etc so this model is is gone but why, is, why, is, why, is Zillian, why the litigation why what's illegal about because, it b because that's not best practice i mean obviously first of all this is a startup raise uh, start a, this is not a decentralized project. So obviously, if you're doing it in the U.S., uh, you are security for one, okay? Because this is a centralized effort. Second, if you are a security and, and you're raising, you're not disclosing to retail that you have a, a vesting schedule and that you're gonna dump on them, and you have pushed uh, a wrong, you have pushed an act as if or 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 a, or a, or a false valuation pushed the false narrative to the public and the retail believed you and bought your token and you dumped on him. So yeah. it's a pump but, 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 in, but in what, what, what projects are you referring to? Because you guys are just making the whole space sound like so terrible. I would like you guys to elaborate on what projects you're talking about because it's not fair to like, you know, look, at, I don't want to show any projects, so, but there's some really good projects out there that have raised in exactly this way. VCs have backed them two, three years ago everything's been fully in order and you can't you can't just couple these people with whoever you're talking about like 
I don't know. I just this whole when space has been so, so negative. It's so negative. Everything is just negative, 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 and it's not fair for like the good projects. What about the guys that have been building projects for two, three, four years? But Jonathan, and Jonathan, sorry about, but Jonathan, Jonathan our, our negativity. I, I just came in now. I don't know if it was negative earlier because when I came in, I came in a bit late. Irina was talking about the positives and the value VCs bring. So I'm not sure if I missed anything before that. Now, remember, I, we invest in probably about two projects a day. So we're involved in the whole structure, the whole model. But when you talk about the um, VCs that raise money, etc., and everything you said, everything is in order. Can you elaborate on this? Because it's not all projects are doing it wrong. But do you, would you put every token launch in the same bucket? No, like I, I get, you know, as a Metaverse Capital, we get offered, you know, 100 pitch decks a month you know we look at them we throw 90 percent of them out but the, you know there are some good guys out there that have been building projects for the last two three years they approach you they say we're raising a seed round like everyone's talking about how unfair it is for retail i don't see any retail guys writing checks when guys approach you with a pitch deck you know like <laughs> that, that's when vcs are putting their money where their mouth is they're backing these projects and they're giving them funding to go out and hire a CEO and go and hire a CTO. I don't see retail doing that. So I don't know. I just think that like, but the retail, but, but, but Jonathan, but retail doesn't get access to those allocations. If retail had the opportunity to invest at those low market caps and get a 10, 20% unlock at TGE in the last cycle, I'm sure they would have well, loved I, to get I those allocations. I don't, you know, the last, the last, uh, you know, 100 projects that I've been offered, I haven't been offered 10, 20% on TGE. That's kind of all changed quite a bit. So, I don't know. If you guys are talking about the 2021 cycle, that's, like, pretty boring. So, so we agree. So, you're yeah, saying that... The, go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, we're talking about this cycle. This cycle, if you ask most of the VCs after a few drinks, they tell you, look, we invest in a project. They do 10x. We get we get 10% unlock. At TGE, we we broke even, and the rest is a free play. So, this is so, this please, is this is the trend me, today. Please tell me, please tell me in the last six months any projects that have done ten x on launch. Tell me five. Just tell me five, because I invested in projects in two thousand and twenty one, and I put my money where my mouth is. I've been advising these projects every week for the last two years, and these projects aren't even doing a two x, and I can't even get any tokens. I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me projects that have done ten x. I didn't so see do any. Those, Tell me that. Do, do you think those days are over, Jonathan? Because we are. No, I'm looking no, at no, I don't think those days are over. I just think right now a lot of money has gone into. It's coming from institutional money, and it's gone into Bitcoin, and the market ran up very quickly. And I don't think money started flowing into altcoins yet. Today we saw a big change in the market, and money starting to flow back into altcoins. But right now, there's no IDO projects that are launching 10, 20x. I mean, if you look across the ages. One of the best and most anticipated projects over the last two, three years. VCs invested in that project in 2020. It launched and it did like, it didn't even do a 2x. You know, I, I've got a big, I think that project is a great project for, for people to invest into now. But I invested in that project. I've got no benefits over retail, but I've been helping them. I've been on calls with them. I've been helping with marketing and branding and everything else. But everyone's talking about those like, you know, those needle in a haystack where these projects do 10, 20x. And VCs go and dump. Fuck, I mean, why can't VCs go and get, like, the initial capital back on some of these projects that they've invested into? I don't see the problem. If you're but investing you in a pump and dump project, and you're not looking at tokenomics, and you're not doing proper vetting, and you're investing in someone out of their garage that doesn't have anything, and they tell you all this stuff behind, like, everyone's back, guys, we're going to launch this thing, we're going to get KOLs involved, and we're going to dump on retail, that's a totally different story. But there are legitimate projects out there that VCs invest into and they have the right to take some money off the table where the opportunity arises. I agree with everything you've said. Are the days, so I'll ask you the question again, and this is the question that I was posing earlier. Are the days that we've seen in the last cycle where you get an allocation and you get a 10, 20, 30, not 30, it's, 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 I don't see these unlocks anymore, but you get, let's say, 10% unlock and you have three, four projects a day doing a 10x. And just for the record, these days came barely came back about a month and a half ago. And that barely lasted a few weeks. Do you think those days could come back, Jonathan, where we see projects on a daily basis launch at a 10x? Those days are 100% not over because retail make the same mistakes every single cycle. So there will be a very frothy stage in the market. I think it's going to be when Bitcoin's over 90k. I think every all the money is going to start flowing back into altcoins. 
And then you're going to have every Tom, Dick, and Harry trying their hardest to get into any pre-sale they can in on, on these launch pads. And then people that only get like a $50 allocation or a $100 allocation on Cedify or, uh, you know, other launch pads are going to go, okay, well, I only got a $50 allocation, but I've been following all my favorite KOLs. Now I'm going to go put $2,000 in at launch. I'm not going to look at the FDV. I'm not going to look at the market cap. I just see it's a 20 cents, even though it's trading at a $5 billion market cap, I'll still go and buy it. So no, I don't think those are, those days are over. And I think they will 100% come back. And then in 18 months time, we're going to hear retail crying again. Oh, I lost all my money. I got scanned by everyone. I got scanned by these KOs. It's all bullshit. Like people unless just they, don't unless do their homework. They, unless, they, unless, they, unless they use Commonwealth, of course. Yeah, I wanted to get to Commonwealth, and I know Kyle, who's been very vocal about this, uh, uh, more vocal than I have for a longer period of time, is going to try to fix the problem through Commonwealth. But let me let me ask one more question to, to Jonathan, because I'm enjoying this back and forth. And just for the audience, I, I think this is a really interesting conversation, because these are, these are the things that we uh, discuss behind the scenes. Um, Jonathan, do you think the, the, the model of launch pads um, will, will, will continue existing as it did in previous cycles? I mean, I've got to be careful what I say, but no, I think that there's some launch pads out there that are very unfair. I really don't want to talk about which launch pads I think are fair because it just it isn't good for the space to go show anything. Um, but I think that there are two or three launch pads. People must go and do their own homework and they must do their own research. And I think those guys that are offering the fair opportunities and that aren't taking... So if a launch pad launches your project and they say raise $2 million for uh, any project, you can pick whichever one you want, they will generally take a fee. It might be $200,000, which is 10% of the raise. I don't know the exact amount. And generally, the company will profit that money. There are launch pads out there now that are putting that money back into the token and I think those are the ones that are going to work best. And I think those are the ones that are going to start getting the best projects. So, yes, I do believe that certain launch pads and that whole model will exist throughout this whole cycle and do very, very well. Okay, and what do you think will be different this cycle from previous cycles when it comes to VC raises and, and token launches, IDOs, IEOs? Nothing. <laughs> you think I don't, I don't, because I think, that, I think that that whole hype is going to come back and everyone's going to be trying to get into all these projects and everyone will forget about how they got burnt and there'll be a whole new string of people that come into the market and they'll be going, oh wow, I want to get into that, this KOL is talking about this project, how do I get in, I go buy through a launch pad, oh I missed the uh, idea, let me just go buy it off the open market and I think the market will keep repeating itself because in 2017 I said this is the last ICO cycle we'll ever see and we've seen it twice again in 2020, 2000 and Bigger. Yeah, we've seen it twice again. So, no, I don't think it's over. I do not think it's over at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with what you said. Certainly. Just quickly, uh, uh, I totally agree. The only added element that wasn't there last time is this. The, the people that took money unfairly are going to cough it back faster than they took it. And this time around... I can see it. I mean, uh, uh, I can see it. Okay, I can see it. I can see a bunch of law firms getting extremely specialized. I can see people documenting uh, everything that happens. I can see uh, key case building. I can see all type of stuff from third parties. So litigation as an industry in our sector is going to become extremely significant, exactly like it is significant in the capital markets in general. What we didn't have back in the last two cycles, we didn't have anyone to litigate. We didn't have uh, ways for people to organize. We didn't have this time around is going to be extremely fast as much. If you take unfair money this time around, you will cough it back uh, with high probabilities. That's all I have to say. Zillion, Zillion, I agree with what you're saying, but it's also, you know, the launch pads need to take some kind of responsibility and do correct betting. So if launch pads are offering projects that are complete rugs so they can make themselves a quick twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a five hundred thousand dollar raise. You know, they must also take a look at themselves in the mirror. I think if the if if these launch pads do the correct vetting and uh, people like Commonwealth are doing the correct vetting, which they are going to be doing, then I think we can see a change in the market and we can get rid of all the garbage out there. As I said, I'm looking at hundreds of decks a month and we get rid of 90% of them, but the 10% that we 
you know, we go on to calls with these these projects, you know, they're, they're building some really exciting stuff. Like, you know, not everyone out there is a criminal in this space. You know, and like I said earlier, everyone chasing this meme coin dream, 99.999% of meme coins are all rugs. Every single one. So carry on going out there and chasing that with hat dream. It comes along once a cycle. Yeah, we're not saying that. We're not saying that everyone. Of course, there is some great value. And I think as we get exposure, as we get access in this environment and we mature, we get access to some great stuff. I 100% I agree with you. And the quality of the project this cycle around are even better than last cycle. But uh, but uh, we're we're talking about the bad the, the you know the the bad players basically and this space unfortunately attracts a lot of bad players because money is easy and you can make money uh, right now so yeah let me let me go to Commonwealth uh, guys uh, just to just to kind of put put the context here first we're investors at Commonwealth second um y y y Carl who's behind the project he's one of the more vocal VCs about the flawed model. He's been in the game for a while through paid ignition, which is a, um, one of the better uh, launch pads in the last cycle and in, in this cycle as well. So you're, you're, you're in a good position, obviously, to talk about what your solution is, but maybe highlight the problem uh, in more detail so the audience understands. Not sure he's talking from the Commonwealth, um, Commonwealth yeah. account. I, I, I'm here talking from the Commonwealth account. Hey, it's Tim. Hey, Mario. Hey, everyone. Hey, Tim. Um, I've actually got another spaces in three minutes, but I'm going to try and, you know, sort of be very succinct here. Um, a lot of the problems have been highlighted, I think. Um, you know, retail not being uh, you know, offered a table, a seat at the table, I think is, is the main one. You know, I th there's just a huge uh, gap in the market for um, fair practice. And I think a lot of people are talking pointing towards fair practice. The problem statement is clear and obvious. Retail just don't want to be exit liquidity anymore for people who are somehow privileged to get in before them. Now, Commonwealth using Web3 technology is essentially just evening the playing field. It is, is a, it is a decentralized VC. <clears throat> it's fully on chain. I don't, want to, I don't want to get the lawyer person coming saying, oh, but that's going to be totally illegal because he doesn't understand the legal model. The legal model is very tight. It's very buttoned up. It's, it's legally decentralized over a, a roadmap period. Um, Commonwealth is basically governed by smart contracts, but the, the whole beauty of Commonwealth is literally inviting the 99% who have otherwise been coming in much later, get them in earlier, earlier than launch pads, get them in at the same stage, the, the seed, the pre-seed, the private rounds, get them in at the, get them investing alongside yourself, Mario, alongside Kyle, alongside A16Z, get them, get them into the next Ethereum, the next Solana pre launch that's the whole reason but that's but, but Tim, isn't that isn't that what launch pads do like how, what, what do you do no, that's different to existing no, launch pads launch pads are bringing you in at launch like there's a whole like value creation period pre-launch which is like when you know for example if if commonwealth w w opened up its funding uh with the genesis nft like two years ago normal projects don't open up their funding to the public at that stage they they they'd move it to private investors vcs and so forth this is where Commonwealth is going to get in. Commonwealth is going to come in as a VC early stage, like at the earliest stage possible. And it's going to guerrilla market. It's going to bring uh, traction towards the projects. It's solving a lot of pain points in the industry. And it's just making it more fair and democratized. Okay, so, so just for the model for the audience to understand, the general model of the project goes to VCs, raises money for, for various rounds, seeds, pre-seed, seed, private, one, private, two, etc. Um, and then goes to launch pads and raises a small amount from the public. And the, the what Commonwealth does different is you guys bring in the public even earlier than the, the, the pre-sale stage? Correct, correct. The Commonwealth system is designed to come in at earliest stage possible. It, it comes in at the private rounds, in with the, the privileged investor groups, the institutions, with, yeah. And you're saying everything's, everything's on chain, everything's decentralized, just from a legal aspect? Correct. Correct, yes. Is there anyone else doing this? No, as far as I know, there's not. You get syndicates, which is very different because those are semi-private, and also they're not like... Um, they're not VC, you're talking about like VC syndicates? VC syndicates, yeah. It's just a, it's a bunch of people, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, oh, but and they, 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 they co-invest together. But this is a very different model. How does that differ to the whole decentralized VC model that we've seen? Like they, they, they create a, a token, and any token holder can invest in projects, gets exposure to the projects. And uh, there's a few I'm thinking of. 
Well, uh, I, I don't know the decentralized VCs you're talking about, but I don't think any of them have a retail application, which is mobile first. So our, our CTO who's on the call, Tony Kelly, he worked for Activision Blizzard. He actually brought out Call of Duty to 600 million people in the world. So he knows how to sort of scale software. He's developed a mobile first application, which allows people to come in. And, you know, the, the scale is a huge factor here. So um, getting hundreds of millions of people together to be like a, a Wall Street bets type um, community and co-invest together with a sort of a Robin Hood style app. That's that's the niche of the market that, that Commonwealth is, is going for. And I don't, as far as I know, there's not anybody else that's doing that. You don't need Tony? a token to, to, to invest with Commonwealth. Token? Uh, sorry, Tony? How are you, sir? Can you hear me? Tony, got to unmute bottom left corner. By the way, the audience, I know you're having issues with the comments button. It's not working today. Just kind of a heads up. Not sure. If, uh, yeah, Tony, how are you? Um, it's, uh, we'd love your thoughts. Like it, when I want to talk to Kyle about this, he was he's been vocal about Commonwealth for a long time, um, yeah. and and what he said is like, Mario, this is the the so bringing the VC world to the ninety nine percent to the people that don't yeah. have that. The, and one 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 ugly thing that we like about crypto is that it gives people like us the unfair advantage of coming into projects really early at really good terms, whether you're at KOL. Um, or, or you bring in value through a, as a VC or as an advisor, uh, or you've got any sort of clout or trust in the ecosystem. Um, so Commonwealth is aiming to fix that pretty significant problem in crypto, something that we even complain about, us playing yeah. the game. Um, and um, uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on it and how you, you, how you plan to achieve that. Sure, sure. Like get kind of bringing retail investment in meant that, you know, we got two difficult problems, right? We have to explain the intricacies of VC and early stage investments. And then there's all the barrier of the Web3 infrastructure, uh, you know, for a, a newbie or retail investor is a barrier. So we set out to kind of make it uh, a really slick user experience. Number one, uh, all the team was fully doxxed day one. We built in Stealth, um, and we only came out of Stealth when we did the first raise, and that was with, look, here's the prototype we built, here's the vision. Um, and since then, we've been building in public. Um, but in addition, we put a lot of time into kind of trying to give it a really comfortable environment for a retail investor, whether it's um, explaining how dil due diligence works, getting them involved at a very early stage. So we're funds-based which means that rather than coming in and putting all your disposable income into one bet or one project, we've got a, a pool like in the priceless fund. For example, there's a pool of 15 projects. And if 70 or 80% of them actually launch and make it to market, as we would expect, you have effectively got 13, 14 different chances of kind of bringing some kind of return. And in addition, all our smart contracts are non-custodial, fully audited. Um, our last smart contract audit was a 10 out of 10 score, I believe. Um, but in addition, we get your money back much faster. As soon as the, token, the project starts um, harvesting its tokens and we sell them for USDC, we stream the USDC straight back to the investors immediately. Um, and I think that's a kind of a really nice model. And in addition, then we also make you liquid for the entire entirety of your investment. Um, your receipt for investing into one of the funds is a fractional NFT, which you can split and sell in whole or in part from the moment you mint it, kind of giving you control over your own funds from end to end. Um, and then the last part, as Tim mentioned, we're aiming to be fully decentralized, but also fully automated end to end. This whole system, you know, should just run 100% um, of the time, every time, really, um, and as decentralized as possible. Hold on, is that, is that, what does that do to the whole v VC structure? So would a project raise part of, would, would part of the raise be from VCs, VCs will always be here to stay, and part of it from retail? And do you think it could disrupt the entire VC model, which is bad, bad for people like us and Kyle, <laughs> but, well, but good for, 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 for the retail? Yeah, not necessarily bad, right? It's, I think it's being building in public and kind of investing in public and being transparent about this is better for everyone. So um, our entire process is very open. So we have a pool of like 10 or 15 VCs and oracles, just like Kyle and John and Tim, who work in the space literally every day. So these guys are able to bring the best of the best to us. And part of our criteria for an oracle proposing a project is they must have invested in it in themselves. They must have skin in the game already. So that's already a soft signal to an investor, right? That a professional has, you know, passed this and put their own money where their mouth is. 
But what we're finding when we're looking at some of these projects is that three, four, five of our oracles have invested in the same project. So that's another signal for us. So at the time we've proposed that to the investors in a fund and started the introduction to the project, they're already involved in due diligence um, on these projects. And we have a very structured uh, process. You can see all the information is displayed in the app. And it's quite detailed from what I've seen um, compared to a lot of the due diligence that's done in crypto as a rule. Mm. The guy spent 20 years in Silicon Valley and doing M&A in the games industry. And it's a much more rigorous process than I think many retail investors would even be used to, you know. Kyle, I've, I've, I've changed the title of this space a few times as you speak. I, I think this is pretty significant change to the structure in which projects raise capital. Now, you've been very vocal, I think more vocal than any other guest we've had on stage, um, on the floors, and I think you'd be very courageous to do to be this vocal considering Master Ventures and how much you guys invest. Um, can you maybe, in your own words, what is wrong with the current VC model and why is it unfair to retail? This is a question for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> well, it's. I think that. Uh, so what? What I think should be happening is I think that we the the day is the day. What, what's the the retail is getting smarter as the educators go through. They become smarter and more educated themselves, right? The people who have the biggest voices now have been through at least one cycle before, very involved, or many cycles, and we're observing and we're learning collectively. And so that education is being passed down to people who are, uh, who are, who, who we're talking to. And so what we're realizing is just like, Oh, exactly what's going on. And we're comparing cycle to cycle and what's going on. I've been, yeah, as you know, speaking about this for a long time, that, uh, that I think that there was, you know, that, that, that's the ICO model. Uh, although, it was flawed to some degree. There was a lot of scams, but there was also a lot of great projects that came out of that 2017 time with very loyal and big communities. And the problem is, is that people, a lot of, a lot of it has to do with maybe regulation. Um, and so we switched this kind of airdrop model, which led to a really horrible kind of uh, way to distribute tokens to people who literally don't care about the project versus getting a lot of people, like the whole point of an ICO, for like Ethereum, for example, was to get a big distribution of tokens to a lot of people who were in very early, believed in it, became loyal community members, became part of the family. And, you know, you, you see posts all the time on X about, you know, how important it is to have a, a big community for success here. And when you exclude the only people who are going to participate in community from from being able to get access into that at an earlier stage, a fair valuation, and you're asking them to buy in at a billion, two billion, three billion, four billion, it's just, they don't feel special because what happens is they become exit liquidity for the VCs who got in much, much lower. The VCs, the KOLs, the market makers, the exchanges, everybody got the deal except for the people that you want to be community. And so from, from my perspective, you know, uh, and there's a lot of misalignments of values, right? Project founders are often naive on how to go to market. And so they listen to who they believe to be, um, you know, advisors and market makers. And, you know, and they take their advice and they say, oh, you have to have a big pump on day one. Otherwise, your project is over. When that's not true at all. Right? The, the, you have to look at who is giving you advice and what is their best interest, right? And when it comes down to market makers, their best their, their best interest is to see as many clients as they can, and they take profits. Oftentimes, take profits on how much they liquidate or sell your tokens. Uh, when it comes down to uh, to launch pads, ideal launch pads, majority of them will will have a discussion with the founders and say, if you want to launch on our launch pad, we need you to modify your token metrics so that you have very little circulating supply on day one so that there's not a lot of sell pressure, so that the token can pump, and they'll literally brainwash or the, the project into believing that how much you pump on day one is relevant for the future success, success of your project. And people believe that, and that's a complete lie. And, uh, and then you have exchanges who also want to, they ask you for a huge amount of tokens on listing, um, and also want to control the sell pressure on day one. And so, you have, and then you, so just everybody, and same thing with KOLs, they want a bunch of, uh, of tokens unlocked on, on TGE. 
Um, so the only pe so everybody gets to sell on the only tokens circulating on day one. Oftentimes are like the people who are quote unquote advising a project on going to market um, with their intention to, to extract as much value as possible from that opportunity. They don't have to face the the music when it comes down to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight weeks after the launch. Their job is done and they're gone. Oftentimes. Uh, and, and then it's a, the project who has to de deliver on that. And you, if you have a low circulating supply and a high valuation, that means you're facing massive, massive hyperinflation like situation. And unless you have a real product that generates real revenue that like from day one, that can offset that kind of inflation, which means you have to generate a lot of revenue and have a really good product then you're going to be you're going to be just like every other country that that has gone through hyperinflation just so, just for the audience it's kind of, i want you to continue i'm just going to read out something that binance put out four days ago and give you the mic again just for the audience to understand that kyle who he's got a launch pad paid ignition which we're involved in he's got um uh, master ventures a vc fund he's been in crypto for a long time so this is someone who's part of the game and kyle i'm speaking on your behalf part of the game highlighting things behind the scenes you know everyone says don't hate the play or hate the game, whatever it is. Well, we're telling you the flaws in the game. And now he's launching Commonwealth, which is a solution to the game. Obviously, we're invested in Commonwealth, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking as an investor. But also, I've been vocal about this issue for a while as well, since the last cycle. And a lot of VCs have been talking about coming up with some sort of solution. Binance put out a press release that we're going to discuss in tomorrow's show as well. Carl, come in tomorrow's show, Crypto Town Hall, because we're going to talk about this exact issue. And we could talk about uh, 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 organically talk about Commonwealth then, but it says Binance says the following. Just listen, everyone. The prevalence of tokens with high valuations and low initial circ initial circulating supply has been a topic of discussion among the crypto community in recent months. This stems from concerns that such a market structure leaves little sustainable upside for traders after the TGE, the token generation event. And then they, they say data from Coin Market Cap and Token Unlocks confirm the growing trends of tokens launching with low circulating supply and high valuations. Notably, it is estimated that approximately $155 billion worth of tokens will be unlocked from 2024 till 2030 over the next six years or so. Without a corresponding increase in buy side demand and capital flows, the, sustain, the substantial amount of tokens coming onto the market poses significant selling pressure. Factors such as influx of private market capital, aggressive valuations, and upbeat market sentiments have contributed to this trend of tokens launching with high FDVs, fully diluted valuations. And for anyone that doesn't understand the difference, we won't explain it now. Market cap versus fully diluted valuation. The market cap is the listed to the, the, the tokens that are floating. FDVs, all tokens, including all the lock tokens as well. And this is where the game of manipulating the FDV through a small float comes in last couple of sentences here the current market setup makes it important for investors to be selective and discerning by considering fundamental aspects of a project such as tokenomics valuations and the product itself and, and this is something we're very cognizant of and uh, now project teams may also need to consider the long-term implications of decisions made relating to tokenomics design vcs continue to play an important role in our industry and can work together with project teams to ensure equitable supply distributions and reasonable valuation. So that came out from Binance four days ago for anyone that, and they, they also put out a guide for projects that want to you know, launch on Binance's launchpad, uh, which is the Crepe de la Crème, and what they need to be on the lookout for and what Binance is looking for. So Kyle, I'd love your comments on that statement by Binance four days ago. What does it mean for the industry? And then going back to Commonwealth and how Commonwealth fixes that problem as well. Yeah, um, so, they so yeah so what they also came out with the following statement after that uh you know it was a a dear binanceians you know and like we recently put out a report from binance research exactly what you just covered mario um with that being said we'd like to uh, we'd like to be what they say industry leaders in uh, in shifting that mindset and making a change and we're, this is an open call to all medium and small valuation companies or projects who have one organic good communities, sustainable revenue generating economic models, um, you know, promising founders and, and this kind of stuff, which is literally exactly what Commonwealth is. And it's one of the very, very, very few projects in the space that have done that. And I'm in an interesting position here where we're talking about VCs, we're talking about value add uh, investors, we're talking about launch pads, we're talking about go to market. 
I happen to be the co-founder of both Paid Network, where Commonwealth is launching and doing their public sale, and I'm also a co-founder of, of Commonwealth. And I spent the entire bear market thinking about how do we solve for these problems? How do we make it a more sustainable space? Because these kind of things are not sustainable. And so uh, really, the Commonwealth team and myself, we have been spending the past two and a half years it all centers around our sustainable economic model. And uh, and so what we spent a brutal amount of time vetting through multiple PhDs in economics and our own experience and uh, game theory and all this stuff, designing a sustainable model. So basically Commonwealth is a, is a revenue generating machine. Like that, and so is paid network. And, and I say that everything I say for, for Commonwealth can be uh, echoed for paid network because it's a very similar type of economic model and it's one of the these are two of the projects in the entire space that actually are focused on this and have been for a very long time so uh and, and i'll tell you the 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 so this this sale is happening uh starts tomorrow and it goes for two days um on paid network and to start off with we want it to be community first always so commonwealth the first round of investors at the best valuation was not VCs, it was retail. Um, so instead of having five VCs or three VCs leading the, the first lowest valuation round, it, we opened it up from day one to the community. And so the community came in and, and bought these NFTs, which represented their SAFT. SAFT was, was an NFT, something that represented their uh, their size of the, of the tokens. And uh, the second round, the next valuation, uh, was also from retail, which means that by the time that we already did two run rounds of financing, it, we had, a, a, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand uh, shareholders, essentially, if you would call it that, the equivalent of that, on the cap table, not 10, 15 uh, VCs. And I'm not saying that VCs are, are bad in any way. In fact, I think that there's a happy medium moving forward. I think that, you know, uh, I, I believe that a high signal, high value add VCs are great to seed a project because the you know, seeding project is the most uh, risky stage. And and then I believe, uh, you know, moving forward, that's kind of when I think Commonwealth would like to look at rounds when there's some sort of product, you have a, a high signal VC. But I think that the days of, of, of low value add or no value add VCs are over. Uh, that's where Commonwealth comes in. We bring, bring great value to projects. That we bring the the Wall Street bets, what we call All Street um, community, to a project uh, from the very beginning. Because the way that the uh, economic model is built, if you hold wealth tokens, you're going to benefit from the investments that Commonwealth makes and profits from. Uh, and that's a lot to get into why that happens. But um, it, it, believe me, it's, it's it, it does. <laughs> and uh, and so. Um, we we only had a, a few VCs who participated at the third round, and that was only because they were uh, what we call or oracles. And oracles are the way of I think Tony mentioned it before. It's one of the levels of that our projects are vetted to to minimize risk. Commonwealth is a, mis, a, a risk minimized platform. Uh, the way that we look at it, and that is because the the oracles who can bring deals to the funds in Commonwealth, they they have they have to have had invested into the project themselves first, either as an angel or on behalf of their fund. And we have really, really great funds and angels involved, guys from Hashkey Capital and Animoca and, and Cypher and many more. Um, and so they, they will already invest. They already did, did due diligence themselves. And then they can propose to the, the, the fund of Commonwealth, whatever one is open. Uh, an opportunity, right? Hey guys, we've got you know this this deal that we just invested into, and you, there's two hundred fifty thousand dollars available. And then it's the the shareholders of the fund, the people like the retail, the ninety nine percent who have who have now invested into a fund that get to, to vote on whether they want to invest into that deal or not. And they have time to debate that. They can do AMAs with the founders and do due diligence for a while of time. And that's uh, and, and that's kind of um, you know the, the the structure from a high level of how Commonwealth works. Uh, and so these kind of things about the low float and stuff like that that will obviously be considered. Um, you know, uh, Commonwealth itself is coming out with a very distributed um, you know set of wallet holders, and uh, yeah, it's from from the very beginning. And that's also why Paid took the stance of doing is trying to bring things back into a broad distribution perspective. We are asking project founders to 
sell a lot of tokens, not necessarily at a high valuation, but sell a large percentage of your tokens to retail. Get it distributed. Get it out there. Think about the things that went right in 2017. Think of it in, under, with that model in mind. So I'll leave it there. And then I, I guess if anyone else wants to, wants to add anything or any more, more questions there, but that's... Yeah, I think I, I want to dig into this a bit more tomorrow. I know it wasn't planned in, in Crypto Town Hall. When is the token listing, by the way, Carl? So I know how much time we have in a couple of days. So we do. So tomorrow uh, we have. So on, on paid network, um, as uh, like we're just kind of doing this relaunch now uh, as we rebuilt, rebuilt the platform and, uh, and, and wanted to make it open to everybody. That's another thing that we focus on is inclusivity. You know, um, blockchain and crypto at our ethos was always supposed to be about inclusivity and uh and, and launch pads became very exclusive just for the rich just the, these high tiers um that were hard to get into very expensive and so if you were someone that who only had 20 investable dollars it was never never feasible for you to invest into a public sale um mm. with, with paid it, it's a completely different model where anyone can come participate that's called open pool so there's two pools one of them is the the early access and that they get no special benefits other than just 24 hours ahead of time so they can take their time. They don't have to rush. They don't have to sit by their computer. It's like flying first or business class. You pay for the experience by staking tokens, um, but you still have the same fee structure, the same valuation, the same everything as open pool. So that starts tomorrow, uh, I believe 1 p.m. Uh, UTC, and then 24 hours later would be open pool that opens up. Um, it is a very large raise and, uh, it, you know, and, um, and then we have, I don't know if it's been published yet, but we have uh, some really cool mechanics around it. Uh, Tim, maybe you can mm -hmm. tell people where they get more information. And then also, um, yeah, people people should go over there as, to pay network as quickly as possible and register, even if they're undecided at this point, if they want to participate or not, because there is uh, a point when the registration closes, which is in like, I think, 12 hours from now or something like that. Yeah, the reason I also want to talk about this um, uh, in tomorrow's show as well, because it's something that Niran and Scott on Crypto Town Hall debate heavily, and uh, just the entire VC model in crypto. Um, but uh, just last quick question for you, Khan, before going to Tim and then wrapping it up. Uh, do you think the days that we've seen in the previous market, we had the gentleman from Metaverse Capital, um, I think it's Metaverse Capital, Metaverse Capital? Metaverse John, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, John John is pretty pretty damn good speaker. And he said he expects the same cycle to repeat itself, you know, tokens pumping at launch like the old days. Um, do you think that we'll see the same, you know, same shit as the previous cycle? Or do you think that there is, isn't retail demand for IDOs and IEOs and ICOs as we've seen previously? No, but we're definitely going to have the same behavior, the same things as, as last cycle, and I, because the, you have a rational behavior. And the problem is, is, is the marketing around this. And this is the biggest problem that I have. What you end up having is you have, again, these VC, but it doesn't even have to be VC. Like you have deception everywhere. And so I encourage people to go look a little bit scratch under the surface just a little bit and do some research because you you'll see like I, I um there's one very famous launch pad right now and you if you go back and look at the different things that they've done you see a lot of projects on there that don't even have founders listed right they just when a new hot narrative comes out they just so happen to have the project that's that's in that narrative when, and it looks exactly like the thing basically the point i'm making is there's a lot of vaporware out there a lot of fake following fake social media growth and then what they do is they manipulate the the thing to where they make it very low circulating supply and they only sell a hundred thousand dollars of public sale or two hundred fifty thousand dollars public sale and it's very opaque you don't know how the winners are chosen to participate in that and so the very few people that get into that very few you know, i mean we're talking maybe a hundred two hundred people sometimes oftentimes less like mario when you were on space we found out satoshi vm had zero people that got into that but it was advertised as a 300x and so it, it's like it's like this thing that 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 the you know dangling the carrot in front of people's uh thing face that never they never actually get to to, to experience and so it's just often led by uh, by false promises what i encourage people to do and what we're what we are trying to educate is, is have more realistic expectations, have higher circulating supplies, less less inflation moving forward, more distribution, and more realistic expectations of, of returns on a launch. Like if you can do, get in early and you can get off and, and overnight you do a two, three, four X, like that's amazing. And then that's also much more sustainable because if you haven't noticed, 
everything that launched at a 50, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 X this year is now down into the right only. Right. And, and that is what happens when you have low, that is exactly what happens with every chart that has a low float and high FTV, unless you're Sam Altman, right? Like then, then you, then that just getting, getting, get getting that, getting that demand to sustain uh, that FTV. Um, it, it is is very difficult for the projects, it's a, especially with the volume of projects launching right now. Um, so you know, I appreciate you, you know, kind of shedding light on this problem for for for, for years now, um, and we'll be having that discussion again tomorrow. And I think the main discussion for, for any, tomorrow on for <laughs> anyone my, for, for anyone who wants to learn more about this in depth, uh, I, I my whole schedule is a little bit off right now, but um, but I but tonight before I go to bed, it's uh, I will be making a video about the economic models that I believe to be sustainable um, and, and how you can offset inflation with real revenue and why projects need real revenue. If you go to DeFi Llama and you look at the protocols and you look at the projects that are actually producing revenue, there's almost none. There's 200,000 plus tokens in the space. There's maybe 20 of them that are producing decent revenue. And, uh, and, I, I, and the way that we've structured Commonwealth and Paid Network both uh, the revenue is, 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 is a lot. We would put it up there in like the top, top 10, as far as revenue generating protocols in this space. And, uh, that's what, that, this is what people should be paying attention to. And, and when we get more sophisticated investors and they're coming now, we have institutions coming in, you get the gateway from Bitcoin and they start to look at more risk exposure opportunities. How do you think they're going to value our space, our, our assets? They're going to look at things that that how they've always valued at things price to earnings ratio right like that's the most common way to value a stock is, is price to earning so they're gonna and, and if you go to a lot of these platforms like like defi llama you can find price to earnings ratio right and and so uh that is going to be how the big money comes in and looks when they want a bit more risk a bit more exposure a bit more upside they're going to leave they're going to come and put a small percentage of portfolio which is a lot of money compared to retail into the good projects that are generating revenue because it's easy for them to understand, right? Yeah. Too many final words? No, no just you guys were very kind to pin the tweet where which has got the link. I'm always a fan of people having the right link, otherwise you'll end up in, in some fake site. So anybody wanting to participate in, in the public sale and learn more about Commonwealth, um, yeah, the link is, is pinned in the spaces. So I think that's important for always using the right links. Thanks for having us, man. Not at all, man. Uh, we're we're going to talk about this again tomorrow, Carl. Make sure you join Crypto Town Hall tomorrow. It's going to be a pretty good debate that a bunch of VCs and me, Ryan Scott, will probably go off at. Um, I, I think Ryan is, we, one, a day I wasn't on the space, he kind of went off at the whole VC model. Uh, Scott is very pessimistic. And we had James earlier who was, uh, you and him say that you know, the same thing is going to happen again and, and that retail demand for token launches is going to continue. Um, but for Commonwealth, love what you've built, man. I've, I've been following it for a while and, and good, you know, happy to be part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, man, make sure you join tomorrow. Post that video for everyone else. We'll see you at the next show. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.